we are back, and today we're going to talk about, again, what, what's physically happening in terms of the Kirkendall effect. So let's go back to Kirkendall's experiment again. He had a brass diffusion couple, placed molybdenum wires along the length, uh, wrapped it in pure copper, and then we saw that basically this interface moved, that these uh, molybdenum wires moved after kneeling at high temperatures for long time. This is kind of a key aspect um, as well. So we said previously that in the C-frame, uh, we need to have uh, basically the number of sites be conserved, i.e. the diffusion of one in the C-frame plus diffusion of material two in the C-frame plus diffusion of uh, vacancies must all be equal to zero. So uh, we know that if D1 is equal to D2, that we're not going to have any interface motion, but we are picking two different materials. So let's say that in this diffusion couple that we're going to see on the next page that uh, blue material is smaller. And so we're, let's go ahead and look on the next page. So the blue material, R1, one is smaller. Thus, we should expect that D1 is greater than D2. Uh, let's go see what other assumptions we can kind of make. So blue is smaller and thus has a higher intrinsic diffusivity. Also, we could say that one, the blue, has a higher solubility in red than red has in for blue. So again, based on the solubility, if one has a higher, the solubility of one is greater than the solubility of two, or one into two and then two into one, then again, typically the diffusivity one is going to be greater than the diffusivity of two. So larger solubility means typically a higher diffusivity. So let's go ahead and we could actually, so we're going to make the assumption that D1 is greater than D2. And we can also kind of prove that by showing that this, for example, actually, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and try to erase that. So we could say, for example, that this is our concentration of one. And thus, if it has a higher diffusivity, then this is going to be our concentration of two. Basically, we're never getting, you know, we're never diffusing in there. So that's kind of what's physically happening. Again, happening in here. So what is going to kind of happen? Again, we could kind of draw the fluxes in this system as well. So in this diffusion couple that we're going to draw, what's going to be kind of our fluxes? So diffusion of one is greater than this. So my flux of the blue is going to be large, J1C. And then the flux of two is going to go in the opposite direction, like here. Flux two in the C. And what's remaining is I'm going to have to have some flux, again, because I need to make sure, due to my condition of the C-frame, that J1C plus J2C plus J vacancy C is equal to zero. So this must be the flux of my uh, vacancies in the C-frame. So what's happening, again, this is all great mathematically, but what's happening physically in the system? And then how is that going to cause our interface to move? So this is where we have kind of, again, this nice little uh, and kind of great example. So let's go ahead and imagine that this is at time t equals zero. And actually, I'm going to zoom in here. Uh, I'm to figure out how to do that in a second. So let's zoom into our system. So the green marker is basically my marker, my interface. Uh, it's essentially this right here. So and again, I'm in the C frame, so I'm sitting on this atom. So at time t equals zero, this is the situation. There's some concentration, these are basically vacancies, right? This is what we call, again, this is basically an edge dislocation. Uh, edge dislocation. It's our extra half plane of atoms. So we have some vacancies kind of here that you can kind of see here. But anyways, so we have some atoms, some extra half planes, some incomplete half planes. And now what's happening in our system? Well, we have basically this mass flux of one atoms going in to this side here. So what's happening, and more of those atoms, again, the flux of this is larger than the two atoms going in the opposite direction. So what's happening here is that more of these, we could kind of imagine these are blue atoms. Blue atoms here, blue atoms, blue atoms, blue atoms, and then you kind of your red atoms on the other side as well. So these are your red atoms, and they're kind of moving you know, around here. So if there's more blue atoms moving over here than red atoms going on the other side, what's happening is that basically we are filling up these extra half planes with blue atoms because there's more blue atoms moving from here to here than red atoms going in the opposite direction. So the blue atoms, material one, because of this condition, 
are filling these extra half planes. So they're filling up these extra spaces. Now, if atoms are flowing in here and taking up these extra spaces where there used to be vacancies, where are the vacancies moving? Well, we know right here the vacancies are moving in the opposite direction. So when the vacancies move, what happens? Well, first off, these atoms are disappearing. Again, there's some flux of you know red atoms along this side. But the vacancies are coming in. I'm going to kind of change to my cyan color. The vacancies now are going to kind of occupy these sites. They are going to basically fill up and destroy these extra half planes. So they are no longer going to appear because, again, this is just vacancies now. Those atoms are gone. So what we have here is a scenario like this. Because we have a larger flux of atoms on one side versus the other, we are getting, on this side, where the flux is larger of atoms, we're creating or creating slash extending these extra half planes on this side. And on here, we have vacancies. So we are creating extra half planes here. We have vacancies that are destroying half planes on this side. Because the vacancies are moving and they're killing, they're gobbling up, they're eating, you know, it's like, kind of like Pac-Man. They're eating up these extra kind of uh, half planes. So what's happening physically now to our marker here? So we have planes that are being added on this side. We have planes that are being, that are disappearing on this side. So here, because these extra half planes, this material or this kind of you know side is going to be expanding, right? Because again, I need to be at my you know equilibrium distance, like two R. I can't you know shove those little particles in. So we're expanding on here. Here, there's empty space, so we're contracting on this side. Contract, contract. So, so where's the interface going to move? The interface is going to move to the left. It's going to always move in the direction where the vacancies flow. So let's go ahead and actually we can pull up a, a nice little kind of demographic or demo to kind of show it here. So this is a time t equals zero. Look at we're extending. The, see, these planes are extended. The other planes were destroyed, and now our marker is moving because again we're creating these extra planes. The other uh, the other planes are you know contracting, so the interface is going to move. And the interface always moves in the direction of the vacancies uh, flowing. So this is a real and actually really important, uh, there's some really critical consequences to this type of motion. So one of the things that you'll also hear in terms of, uh, not only in terms of the, uh, uh, the Kirkendall effect, but you'll also hear, hear this term uh, that's called uh, Kirkendall pores. So let's actually go ahead and get the material here. So you'll hear this term. Where do the Kirkendall pores form? So we all know that pores are what types of defects? Three-dimensional defects. Excellent. Uh, everyone answered, I know. So if you leave, again, Kirkendall pores can only form if we have long, high enough temperatures and long enough times. But if you have long enough temperatures and long enough times, eventually on this side you know, of the material, there's going to be so many atoms flowing this way Vacancies are going to flow towards here. We're going to be gobbling up each of these kind of half planes that eventually you're going to see pores form on this side. And that's kind of the key. That's where the Kirkendall pores are going to form. Because again, we're creating planes here, and then there's going to be voids of material missing there. So Kirkendall actually observed that in his, uh, in that experiment as well. So let's kind of just go back through quickly and kind of read through uh, our notes here. Uh, again, you can kind of see Flux of vacancies towards the blue end. More vacancies are consumed. Um, blue cars on the, uh, the red side. Extra half planes and atoms will grow on the red side. Blue side, destroy half planes. Original plane will move towards blue sides. It's always going to move in the direction of the vacancy flux. That's the key aspect here. So for Kirkendall's experiment, intrinsic diffusivity of zinc was larger than copper. That is a unique example because if we look at, let's look at copper, for example. So we can see copper. So copper, and then copper is actually smaller than zinc, but zinc actually moves fast. But again, uh, that's kind of a, a unique example. Uh, you wouldn't have kind of be given one of those on an exam. But anyways, the, uh, the diffusivity of zinc is larger than that of copper. So the flux of zinc 
um, from the bar to the cure copper will be larger than the flux in the opposite direction. And then you get, again, this kind of same idea uh, occurring. So you get these pores that kind of open up on the side as well. So you can get those Kirkendall pores at, as long as you have, again, you're kneeling at high enough temperatures for long enough times. And they're always going to kind of form uh, on the region that has the higher intrinsic diffusivity. So this was Kirkendall's genius. Uh, again, read that article. And then next time we're going to get into the conjugate, different conjugate forces that drive diffusion. So I'll see you all next video. Thanks.